The following video features the deadliest real-life animal attacks covered on the channel thus far. These stories include the fatal mauling of their caretaker by a vicious pack of wolves, a man that was mauled by a hippo in front of his loved ones, a brutal polar bear attack that resulted in numerous injuries and a fatality, and much more. These are the world's deadliest animal attacks. Although wolves can be dangerous in certain circumstances, they're generally wary of humans and attacks on people are rare. The following true story, however, depicts one of these improbable incidents, which led to the tragic death of at the time 24-year-old Patricia Wyman. This event would go down in history as one of the most devastating wolf attacks on record. Patricia Wyman was a young and adventurous woman who always had a passion for wolves. She'd earned a degree in wildlife biology from the University of Guelph, where she spent several years studying wolves and their behavior. Her love for these magnificent creatures would only grow stronger after this, and backed by a number of her university professors, who also consisted of mostly wolf enthusiasts that admired her deep passion for them, she would be highly encouraged by them to follow her dreams. Patricia would spend most of her spare time visiting wildlife reserves and learning everything she could about wolves. In fact, her friends and family would call her the Wolf Lady, due to her knowledge of these animals, as well as her devotion to them. Patricia's dreams would one day finally become a reality when she'd land a job as a caretaker at the Halliburton Forest and Wildlife Reserve. The reserve was a stunning 15-acre enclosure, surrounded by lush trees and rolling hills. The exhibit was part of an educational program to help foster a better appreciation for the role of wolves in the wild. Patricia would not only become the new caretaker for the wolves, but she would also run the education program based around them. She'd go on to spend countless of hours observing the wolves from that point on, which in turn would make her already deep love for them grow even more. By all accounts, Patricia was known as fearless, as she'd always been eager to study these magnificent animals up close, determined to use her knowledge and expertise to educate the public about their wonders as a species, and to help foster a better understanding of their place in the eyes of the world. Little did Patricia know, however, that her passion for wolves would lead her down a path filled with danger and uncertainty. As she continued to delve deeper into the world of the wolves, she would soon discover that there was more to these animals than just their beauty and grace. She noted in her observations that they undeniably had a dark side, one filled with danger and unpredictability. Her first two visits to the wolf enclosure were exhilarating, but also nerve-wracking, as despite her passion for them, she couldn't shake off the feeling that these wolves gave her a feeling of unease that seemed to be steadily growing inside of her. And this was true especially when it came to the alpha male. It's important to note that wolves are creatures with unique hunting and social behavior. They hunt in packs using their sharp senses and intense coordination to take down prey much larger than themselves. Their haunting howls, often heard echoing throughout the wilderness, are not only used as a means of communication, but also as a way of intimidation in terms of marking their territory and scaring away competitors. Wolves also exhibit a complex social structure, with each pack having a strict hierarchy and a designated alpha wolf who leads the pack. This alpha wolf is not only the strongest, but also the most cunning of the pack, displaying a level of intelligence that leaves the rest of the pack in awe, as those who've been fortunate enough to witness this marveled at their sharp instincts, stealth, and raw power to bring down their prey. Patricia's observations furthermore noted that this particular alpha wolf was different than any other one she'd ever met before. She would take note of his piercing eyes every time they would stare right through her, and the way he would stand tall and watch her from a distance, never getting too close. And because Patricia was very determined to prove herself as a capable caretaker, she would never report these concerns to her supervisor, as she feared that this was a display of weakness on her part. But this of course would turn out to be the wrong decision. It was a normal day for Trisha as she strides down the enclosure to do her usual check on the wolves. As she neared the enclosure, the wolves start to move about and their howls fill the air. The aforementioned alpha male, whom of course she was wary about, is the first to catch her eye as she enters. But a determined Trisha, despite her fears of him, 
this time stands tall and doesn't let his piercing gaze intimidate her. As she enters the enclosure, the pack then begins circling her, with their curious eyes locked onto her. And it was at this point that in a split second, Trisha stumbles upon a fallen branch and falls to the ground. Her piercing scream then shatters the stillness of the forest, alerting the rest of the pack, who rise to their feet, sniffing the air for what caused the commotion. And just as a traumatized Trisha attempts to get back up to her feet, the alpha male would then lead a charge straight at her. Trisha desperately tries to fend off the first attack by flailing her arms, but the alpha male would prove too quick as he sinks his sharp teeth into her neck in an attempt to neutralize her screams. And as the other wolves join in, their frenzy heightened by the taste of blood, Trisha then begins getting brutally bitten and clawed from all sides, unable to escape the relentless attack. The sound of snarling wolves and Trisha's blood-curdling cries for help fill the air. And with the pack working as one, movements precise and calculated, Trisha is then flung around like a ragdoll as her body is battered by the powerful canines. And with the attack being swift, brutal, and unrelenting, Trisha then, in a final burst of energy, manages to push off the alpha male with everything she had in her. But this victory is short-lived, as the pack then converges upon her once more, with multiple members sinking their teeth deep into her arm and torso. At which point Trisha's screams would die down as she succumbs to her gruesome wounds, her body lying still among the wolves. And in mere minutes, the devastating attack is finally over, as the pack would then retreat from her lifeless body, leaving the forest silent once more, the only sounds being the distant howls of the victorious pack. As the sun rose over the Halliburton Forest and Wildlife Reserve the next day, it would bring with it unimaginable tragedy. As the staff of the reserve made their rounds that day, they noticed something unusual in the wolf enclosure. The typically vocal wolves were silent, and their eyes were trained on something in the distance. And as the staff approached, they would report a sight that would haunt them forever. Trisha's lifeless body was covered in bite wounds, with torn clothing strewn about. Her body had been so severely mauled that most of the staff would instantly turn their heads away upon seeing it. The police would then arrive soon after, and the investigators would quickly determine that Patricia had indeed been fatally attacked by the wolves that she so dearly loved. The news of the attack would spread quickly, and the reserve was soon inundated with journalists and onlookers. The staff of course was devastated, but this wasn't solely because they'd lost a colleague. It was also because they knew what came next for the wolves. Quickly after this tragic incident, the decision would then be made to put down the wolves despite the protests of animal rights activists who'd heard about the case. The investigation into the attack was thorough and revealed some of the specific events that they believe led up to Patricia's final encounter with the wolves. As for the staff of the Halliburton Forest and Wildlife Reserve, life would never quite be the same after Trisha's death. Until this day, they have a hard time forgetting the brave young woman who had given her life to her passion that they too would dedicate their own. The attack would have a profound impact on everyone it touched, as Patricia's family and friends noted that grappling with grief and shock as they try to make sense of what happened has been the toughest thing many of them had to undergo in their lives. And the community would also be affected with many feeling a sense of fear and unease in the aftermath of the attack. And of course, rumors and speculation would run rampant, with some blaming Patricia for what had happened, while others pointed fingers at the staff in the Halliburton Forest and Wildlife Reserve for allowing this tragedy to occur. As experts were called in to examine the evidence and to piece together what had happened in the moments leading up to Patricia's death, it was later found out that it was a combination of factors that had led to the tragedy. The investigators would note that Patricia had ultimately been not experienced enough and was lacking the proper training and knowledge necessary to work with such unpredictable and dangerous animals. Not to mention the enclosure she'd been working in was also found to have serious flaws with inadequate fencing and insufficient staffing, all factors which were ultimately believed to have contributed to the attack. The following episode depicts a polar bear attack that got so out of hand that it would endanger the lives of nearly 80 people and would tragically result in the brutal death of a young man. This is the true story of Horatio Chapel's fatal encounter with one of our planet's most feared predators.
polar bears are some of the rarest and most feared animals on the globe. And although there have been just 20 fatal reported attacks on humans, each one serves as a testament to just how dangerous these formidable predators can be. Spitsbergen is a small island situated within the Arctic Ocean between Norway and Greenland. The snowy, mountainous, and undoubtedly beautiful landscape is one of the coldest and most desolate places inhabited by humans on our planet. This land is mostly untouched, and it's renowned for having 47 incredibly scenic national parks, and over 2100 glaciers. The island nevertheless remains a popular tourist destination for outdoor explorers, and considering its unmatched view of the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights, not to mention its plethora of unique Arctic wildlife, it's no wonder why. However, traversing the icy outback of this stunning location also has its undeniable drawbacks. Throughout its history, Spitsbergen has been plagued by thousands of severely malnourished polar bears who are known to act especially aggressive towards humans. The vast emptiness of the island's ice sheets allows for very little food, and so polar bears will consume pretty much anything in sight in order to get by. In fact, the danger of a potential attack is so prevalent here that it's actually illegal to leave the island settlements without a gun. It's also worth mentioning that five of the aforementioned 20 known fatal attacks have either occurred in Spitsbergen or its surrounding archipelago, most of which unsurprisingly occur with unarmed or ill-prepared tourists. On the 23rd of July, 2011, a group of young explorers set out on a one-month expedition to the island. Among the group were mostly British university students aged 16 to 25, led by several Arctic survival experts from the British School's Exploring Society. This charity foundation aimed to provide adolescents with a unique experience by taking them on nature tours to some of the world's most remote ecosystems. And at the time, the organization had a squeaky clean record with 80 years of nothing but successful expeditions in its resume. The explorers eagerly begin setting up camp, excited for the journey ahead of them. For many of them, not only was this their first true outdoor experience, but it was a strong opportunity for personal growth, as overcoming the adversities and unpredictability of living in the wild and in such conditions is of course no easy task. This particular excursion, however, would right off the bat go much less smoother than the prior ones, as the group would early on realize that they were short on certain supplies. To top things off, a tripwire system designed specifically to alert them of and ward off wild animals would prove to be too short to stretch around the full perimeter of their camp. Not to mention it had some key setup components missing, rendering it useless. And to put the cherry on top of their problems, they then realized that there also weren't enough pen flares for each person, adding to their concerns about their lack of preparation in case things did go south. Despite their concerns, the group would decide to carry on with the expedition regardless of them. The two camp leaders were Mike Reed and Andrew Ruck. Andrew had previously spent over a year in the Arctic, and they never once during that time saw a polar bear, and were furthermore confident that even if they did happen to encounter one on this trip, it would likely get too intimidated by their sheer numbers and scare away. For the first few days, things would go just as planned and the group went about their daily activities of hiking, fishing, animal spotting, and playing games. And by all accounts, everyone was having a blast during this time. Little did they know, however, that in just a few hours, the expedition was about to take an extremely dark turn. It's early in the morning on August 5th, and much of the camp is still asleep. One of the young expeditioners, 17-year-old Horatio Chapel, is the first to emerge from his tent and start his day. He unzips the entrance to his tent and as to not disturb his still slumbering peers, he quietly leaves his tent. And it was at this point that before he could even stand up for a morning stretch, a 250-kilogram polar bear suddenly slams him to the ground from behind, 
instantly knocking the air out of his lungs and causing him to violently plummet to the cold hard ground. As he turns around to see what hit him, the ferocious bear then proceeds to gouge at his face and his neck with its powerful claws, causing a spike of adrenaline to surge through Horatio's veins as he begins screaming for help. He then with all his might struggles to somehow squirm around and pull himself out from underneath the crushing weight of the polar bear. And with nothing but his bare hands to defend himself, it was at this point that Horatio likely lost all hope. As the mighty polar bear then rises and stands up on its hind legs, grabs a hold of the helpless teenager, bites into his torso, and then begins to violently hurl him back and forth in the air like a ragdoll, brutally ending his life before the eyes of his horrified companions. Despite the brutality the group had just witnessed, the seemingly bloodthirsty polar bear then slowly turns its head to one of the helpless boys in Horatio's tent, 16-year-old Scott Benel Smith, and proceeds to charge at him, swiping at his head with an amount of force that could very easily crush a human skull. Mike and Andrew barreled towards Scott's location, armed with a rifle and some rocks. Andrew then throws a large stone at the animal to distract it, while Mike scopes for a headshot. The relentless polar bear would then lunge at Mike and bury its teeth into his head, and the other mortified campers watch helplessly. With the aid of his fight or flight response, Mike would then fight through the pain and back up far away enough to line up another shot, which is when he finally pulls the trigger, fatally striking the polar bear's head and finally putting an end to the gruesome attack. Both Scott and Mike were in critical condition after the attack and were desperately in need for medical assistance with their head wounds. And since they were too far away to be accessible by ambulance, they would have to wait for a helicopter to come all the way from mainland Norway. The chopper would, however, arrive at the scene quite quickly and would thereby successfully transport Scott, Mike, Andrew, and a fourth injured expeditioner named Patrick to the hospital. Mike would suffer the worst of the injuries from the survivors and would require surgery to remove the teeth that the bear had lodged into his skull. An autopsy on the polar bear would reveal that most of its teeth were in fact rotten and it was as they had assumed severely malnourished and underweight. Unfortunately, despite strong efforts by rescuers and eventually doctors once he had been flown into the hospital, Horatio would have no chance of being saved as his neck and face had been so badly maimed that doctors concluded that he had likely died of rapid blood loss caused by the vital injuries he'd sustained during the brutal mauling. Despite this tragic outcome, his peers would go on to regard Horatio as a hero, and this is because his desperate screams for help, coupled with his heroic display of courage to stand up and face the bear with all that he had in him, likely distracted it for just long enough that he stopped it from fatally attacking his peers. And had Mike been unsuccessful in gaining his composure to fire the gun, who really knows how much differently things could have turned out for the expedition. The UK police would launch an investigation into the incident, leading to the discovery of some apparent negligence on the part of the organization that could have very easily been avoided. It was found that the expedition leaders had requested just two hunting rifles, one of which was so old that it dated back to World War II. It was found out that the leaders had failed to set up a night watch to ensure the safety of the campers during the expedition, not to mention the aforementioned crucial lack of vital supplies, such as the tripwire alert system. Despite the lack of protocol for taking on such a high-risk endeavor, the expedition leaders nor the British Schools Exploring Society would end up facing prosecution for the incident. Horatio's parents would go on to start a charity organization called Horatio's Garden in memory of their son, and the charity would go on to build six more such gardens around the UK, with more under construction to this day. Upon visiting these gardens, many people would remark that their atmosphere and calmness gives them a sense of peace, inspiration, and happiness, which is exactly how people that knew him would by all accounts report feeling from Horatio whenever they'd be in his presence. In 2011, 40-year-old farmer Marius Els was fatally attacked by his pet hippo, an incident which would not only devastate those closest to him, but would also raise suspicions about an event that they believed was bound to happen.
Humphrey the Hippo was more than just a pet to Marius Ells. After having rescued him from a severe flood when he was just a baby, the former army major would go on to adopt the orphaned baby hippo and would bring him home to his 400 acre farm where he also kept two other exotic animals, a giraffe and a rhino to be specific. In order to help him settle in and feel at home, Els provided Humphrey with a sprawling lake of his own and eventually feel at home the young hippo would. Some years go by, and not long after he'd reach his fully grown state, where he'd weigh in at a whopping 1.2 tons, the notoriously wild nature of his species would eventually begin to display itself in Humphrey, and that too, in dramatic fashion. He'd one day brutally attack Elza's nephew, inflicting multiple serious injuries to his body, and as if that wasn't enough of a tragedy, Humphrey would, on another day, manage to escape his enclosure and wreak havoc upon Elza's cattle farm, taking the lives of six calves in the process. It's important to note that although hippos may look cute and cuddly, these large mammals are actually considered highly dangerous when provoked. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, hippopotamuses kill approximately 500 or more people each year. That's more than lions, crocodiles, or any other animal on the planet for that matter. Minus mosquitoes and humans, of course. Now, it's not that hippos attack humans because they see them as prey, as they are in fact herbivores. But given their highly territorial nature, they can become highly aggressive towards humans who venture too close to their harems. These are often the sorts of cases that lead to human hippo encounters that result in some of the most gruesome injuries when it comes to animal attacks on record. They possess notoriously massive jaws and long and sharp canines, which they usually use as weapons when fighting other hippos. A single bite from a hippo can almost instantaneously kill a human. So while hippopotamuses may seem gentle, docile, and even harmless from afar, it's probably best to keep your distance. Elza's now famous relationship with his pet hippo would strike chords of both awe and fear within the hearts of onlookers. And this wasn't just due to the incredible force with which he would fling him off his back when angry. It was also because no one could understand why Els was treating a god darn hippo as if it were a pony. It would soon become apparent to his close friends that Els was no longer in control of this wild animal. And as their fears worsened, they too would eventually start refraining from going near Els whenever he'd be with Humphrey. In fear, of course, for not just his, but their own safety. Although he'd be confronted with questions by friends and loved ones numerous times, his reasons for continuing to keep Humphrey would sound more and more deluded as time went on. Els and his wife Louise, an experienced pharmacist, would over time develop a vastly different understanding of the relationship between him and Humphrey. Whereas on one side Els would see their relationship as special, grounded in his unwavering belief that one could form bonds with even the most dangerous animals on the planet, Luis, on the other hand, would grow increasingly anxious due to a rising number of dangerous incidents involving Humphrey, including yet another dangerously bizarre occurrence where he chased a 52-year-old man and a 7-year-old grandson up a tree, leaving them stranded and fearing for their lives for two hours, and as if these incidents weren't bizarre enough, Humphrey was also known to regularly break out of his enclosure and chase golfers at the Orkney Golf Club, traumatizing players, and of course, damaging the course. Johan soon begins dreading his usual weekend visits, knowing that he'd have to witness Els riskily hand-feeding Humphrey. And these were the days where his concerns and his fears for Els's life would rise exponentially, and deep within him, he was almost certain that it was only a matter of time before something terrible happens. Three of Els's family members are on their way to Humphrey's enclosure to watch him during feeding time, something they would often do not just because it would be exciting to watch, but to ease their aforementioned fears. As soon as the men step into Humphrey's enclosure, Johan instantly detects something off about Humphrey's demeanor. Johan points this out to Els, 
who regardless of this asked him to go over and join Els' other uncle Lenny from a safe viewing area where they typically watch the feedings from. Johan thus complies and reluctantly joins the others, and now watches on as Els commences with the feeding. Just as he enters the water in the same manner as he usually does, Els starts whistling and calling over to Humphrey, an action the adult hippo would typically respond to as if a dog would. It's at this point that the men notice a much more pronounced shift in Humphrey's body language, and the shift is for the worse, which is when the worst of danger signs from a hippo suddenly presents itself. When a hippo's ears flatten, this is usually a sign of aggression. The hippo is likely to be feeling threatened and may display other signs of aggression as well such as snorting or yawning. So if you're ever unfortunate enough to see a hippo display this sort of behavior in the wild, it's probably best not to approach and instead give the hippo space to move away from the perceived threat. It's also important to be aware of any other hippos nearby especially if you're near a harem which is typically where they reside, and they are very protective of these homes of theirs, and are very likely to attack if the perceived threat does not move away. Els grabs one of the apples from the bucket that he was about to feed Humphrey from, and proceeds to bite into it as he waits for Humphrey to heed his calls. And it was at this point that Humphrey suddenly charges and knocks him to the ground, biting into his torso with his massive jaws and their bone-crushing power as Humphrey proceeds to violently toss Els' body through the air like a ragdoll, repeatedly biting into him and attempts to secure a better grip on it. Meanwhile, Lenny, as well as his nephew, stand frozen as they watch in horror, and given how quickly everything happened, their hearts then sink to the pits of their stomach when they realize that there is nothing that they can do to save him. It would only take a few short moments for Els' body to go limp, at which time Humphrey would release him from his jaws, allowing the men to pull him to shore. The following story is known as one of the most terrifying hyena attacks in South African history. This horrific attack took place in Kruger Park, a world-famous safari park in beautiful South Africa. A large diversity of mammalian, reptilian, and avian species are home to Kruger's vast mountains, bush plains, and tropical forests, which embody its vast landscape. The park is also home to a variety of the most majestic yet dangerous animals on the continent. A list which includes lions, leopards, elephants, crocodiles, hippos, snakes, and of course, a spotted hyena. No other animals on earth are responsible for more attacks on humans than these seven animals. Not counting humans and bugs such as mosquitoes, of course. It's no secret that as a result of these attacks, many victims have sustained serious or sometimes even fatal injuries. In June of 2016, 15-year-old Erko Jans van Rensburg, along with his parents and two sisters, decided to enjoy a family vacation at Kruger's Crocodile Bridge Camp. The campsite has received multiple nominations for best run camp on the continent for consecutive years in recent history comprising of bungalows, safari tents, and campsites which are known as an ideal camp from which to pursue the Big Five. The site furthermore boasts a laundromat, grocery shop, and a liquor store. Amenities which, unsurprisingly, attract a number of visits from tourists and amateur campers from around the world. Two days into the first weekend of the trip, Erko and his family were having the time of their lives. They were taking in the breathtaking scenery, rare wildlife, and overall awesome adventures that the park had to provide. At the time, it seemed like the perfect family getaway. It's 4.30 a.m. on the third night of the trip. Everyone is fast asleep in their tents with their loved ones. It's quiet, 
yet the sounds of the landscape's wildlife fill the silence with its subtle, yet wakeful ambiance. An adult spotted hyena suddenly emerges out of the bushes and begins quietly making its way towards the family's camp. It stealthily makes its way across a patch of land and in no time arrives at Urko's and his parents' tent. He peeks under the tent and locks his gaze on the slumbering family. It's important to note that although hyenas are famously regarded as opportunistic predators, the truth is that hyenas are extremely capable hunters who have the ability to take down prey much larger than themselves, as well as rip through bone using their formidable molars and premolars, a section of their teeth that can generate bite forces of up to 1050 psi which is enough to easily crush bones as large as up to 2.7 inches in diameter. 15-year-old Urkel lay fast asleep, unaware of his extremely dangerous circumstances, vulnerable and unprotected as the hyena stands almost motionless for a few seconds in front of his head. Urkel awoken to the sound of the bones in his skull crushing like a packet of crisps as the hyena clamped onto his face. The shock of the situation sent instant adrenaline surging through his veins as his fight or flight response kicked in and natural anesthetics filled his pain receptors to allow his mind a chance to process what was happening. Urko screams in horror and agony as the hyena begins dragging him away from the tent towards the bush, a sound which instantly woke Urko's uncle Johan, who just happened to be camping that night next to his brother's family in a camper van right next to their campsite. Johan rushes out of his camper, fearing the worst based on what he had heard, and as his eyes followed the sound of Urko's desperate cries for help, he froze in horror at what he was seeing. The hyena had managed to drag Urko about 30 meters from his tent and had sat on top of him with his mouth still clamped around his head. In an act of sheer altruism, Urko's dad comes rushing out of his camper van in full sprint towards his son, startling the hyena who immediately released the boy's head and ran off towards the bushes and out of sight. Urko was then immediately rushed to the medic clinic in Nelspring before being airlifted to Mill Park Hospital where he was to undergo an immediate 10-hour operation, a procedure which would include 8 hours of reconstructive surgery. Doctors promptly placed Urko in a medical coma and had to do a tracheal incision to enable him to breathe while they operated. To make matters worse for the poor boy, due to the fear that his blood pressure would drop way too low during surgery, the surgeons were forced to perform the surgery on poor Urko with minimal sedation, meaning Urko could very well have been somewhat conscious for parts of his surgery, which would only add to the shock and unimaginability of the circumstances that poor Urko found himself in that night. Ten very long hours later, at around 8.30 p.m., on Sunday evening, Urko was finally wheeled out of the operation theater, unable to speak due to the pipes that his trachea was connected to. After the operation during questioning by reporters, Urko's mother mentioned he will need several more surgical procedures to repair the damage done. He is also receiving preventative treatment for rabies, but he still looks like my little boy, and to me he will always have a sweet little boy's face. He will always be beautiful to me. And the tragic reason Kashandra was saying this? As a result of the attack, Urko not only sustained permanent scarring to his face, but he also lost his left eye, and continues to wear an eye patch on that eye, till this day. As for the hyena, park authorities and investigators later observed that there had been a large hole in the fence that enclosed the campground, and coupled with the predator's powerful sense of smell, it most likely smelled food snuck into the campsite when it was most quiet and tried to find itself an easy meal. And a sleeping young boy would certainly not be off the menu if the opportunity presented itself. Because after all, hyenas are notoriously known as opportunistic predators. Once he could speak again, Urko mentioned that he didn't even realize what was happening during the attack. And this was likely due to the shock of it all. Steve Irwin was just six years old when he caught his first deadly common brown snake, and although such an encounter would almost certainly send shudders down the spine of even the bravest of fully grown adults, 
He'd in his later years recall it as the day that ignited within him an unmatched passion for wildlife, sparking the beginning of a lifelong journey to becoming a household name and a beacon of light for the very animals he not just adored, but innately believed to be highly misunderstood. A daredevil like no other, Steve would habitually put himself in situations with some of the most dangerous creatures on the planet, ranging from some of the most feared land mammals to some of the world's most deadliest snakes and spiders. Steve consistently put his own safety on the line to not just help us humans learn more about these amazing animals, but also bring us some of the most jaw-dropping human-animal encounter footage ever recorded. His smash hit TV series, The Crocodile Hunter, would go on an incredible 11-year run on the Discovery Channel, landing it in the channel's second longest-running shows list, just behind the top spot in the category held by Mythbusters. In September of 2006, however, tragedy would strike and the world would lose a true legend. It was September 4th of 2006, and Steve had been on a boat with his film crew just off the coast of Port Douglas in Queensland. The group was looking to capture footage of tiger sharks for a new show called The Ocean's Deadliest, a show aimed to create an environment in which both current and future generations could marvel at both the beauty as well as the danger of the world's oceans. Whether it was sea snakes, box jellyfish, stingrays, or tiger sharks, animals that would make most people cringe from fear, Steve on the contrary would not just be eager, but excited to get in the water with them. As the day went on, the crew was suddenly hit with bad weather, putting a damper on the filming conditions. Steve urges longtime cameraman and best friend, Justin Leons, to join him on an inflatable and look for something to film. After motoring for just a few minutes, Justin suddenly spots a massive stingray in some shallower waters. Widely considered one of the most fascinating creatures of the ocean, stingrays measure between 7 and 23 feet in length, with a wingspan that can reach up to a whopping 16 feet. Their size allows them to swim as fast as 25 miles per hour, though generally only for short periods of time. That impressive speed is due largely to their ability to use their flexible pectoral fins like wings to help propel them forward in the water. And with a supreme defense mechanism in the form of sharp venomous barbs that can reach up to 12 inches in length, they are also well equipped to deal rapid and nasty damage to any predators that try them. Realizing that this was a perfect opportunity to capture some footage for Steve's 8-year-old daughter Bindi, who was to host an upcoming wildlife show on the Discovery Kids channel, not to mention the plethora of experience that Steve and his crew had when it came to diving with stingrays. Steve was at this point even more eager to dive in and film the magnificent creature. Little did he know, however, that this would be the last time he would ever be filmed interacting with wild animals. Steve and Justin slip out of the side of the inflatable into about chest deep water and have a brief chat about how they were going to film, a protocol they would commonly go over, especially when filming underwater. Justin would always want whatever animal they were filming to be between Steve and himself in the shot, with the animal dominating the foreground. A few minutes go by, and shortly after capturing some good film, the men resurface from the water and decide on one last shot of Steve swimming up from behind the stingray, while Justin gets a shot of it swimming away. As Steve approaches the stingray from behind, Justin excitedly gets the camera rolling as he notices the footage was perfect for Bindi's documentary. Suddenly, and out of nowhere, the massive bull ray appears to become increasingly agitated with their presence, and before he could react, it abruptly props up on its front and begins stabbing wildly into Steve's chest with its tail over a hundred times in just a few seconds. As Justin continued on filming the stingray as it swam away, he slowly pans back to Steve, at which point he freezes in horror as he notices a large pool of blood surrounding his body. Immediately realizing this was no minor attack based on the amount of blood, and not to mention the fact that this much of it would almost certainly attract sharks, Justin cuts the camera feed and scrambles to help Steve. Steve then stands up out of the water and screams, It's punctured me lung. The inflatable that had been motoring just a few meters away rushes over to the men, at which point Justin pulls Steve onto it and assesses his wound. He notices a large, two-inch wide gash over Steve's heart, with blood profusely gushing out from it. The fact that he was visibly in excruciating agony was a clear indication to Justin that the stingray's venom was worsening the already severe pain caused from the kinetic damage from the multiple, rapid stabs he'd endured. 
as a horrified Justin, who still had hope, tells Steve to hold on, that they were getting him to the hospital, that he would make it out of this, and to think of his kids. A suddenly cool and calm Steve, barely able to speak, then utters to Justin, I'm dying. The team tried their level best to keep him calm and stable until the medevac helicopter could arrive. But ultimately, and as previously mentioned, the damage to his heart was more extensive than just the kinetic damage, and Steve would eventually succumb to his injuries. Medical reports would later reveal that Irwin not only suffered massive cardiac trauma during the attack, but both his lungs collapsed with fragments of bone piercing into nearby vessels. Investigators also noted that the fact that Steve was even able to stay conscious and speak until finally succumbing to his injuries was remarkable given the extent of them, indicating just how strong his undeniably big heart truly was. While many people heard of his untimely passing through media sources, his wife Terry would receive the news in a much more heartbreaking way. She had been radioed in from a trip she was on with the kids in Tasmania. She was asked to hurry to the Australian zoo and was informed that Steve had been seriously injured. It wasn't until she arrived at the zoo that a zoo employee would then reveal to her the tragic news of her husband's passing. Although it would be world-shattering for any wife to hear such news, Terry handled the situation gracefully and with strength, carrying on in the tradition that Steve had set, which was to promote the conservation and the love for all animals, as well as spread happiness and hope wherever possible. Steve had always told his camera crew that even if he were to be attacked by an animal during a shoot, that they were to keep the film rolling, and even if it resulted in his death, he always stressed the importance of getting the event on film. And although the tragic and not to mention gruesome footage was indeed captured by Justin, it would afterwards only be used for investigative purposes and would never be released to the public at the request of Steve's family. This tragic incident marked just the third fatal stingray attack in Australian waters since 1945. The other two victims, like Irwin, had both suffered fatal wounds to the chest as well. The knowledge of just how rare human fatalities by stingray are undoubtedly made the cause of Steve's death that much more tragic. Nobody would have guessed that it would be a stingray of all creatures, ones who are typically shy and evasive, to end the legendary Steve Irwin's life especially when one considers the much more dangerous animal encounters he was accustomed to. Of course, it was never a sure thing that Steve would die by the hands of one of the very animals that he adored, but it also wasn't far-fetched for many to assume that this was a possibility, and to some, even an inevitability. Regardless of what people said or thought, we can all be certain of one thing. Steve would never have stopped doing what he loved, even if he'd survived this attack. And what's even more certain, never would he have blamed any animal for doing what came natural to them, a true indicator of the unconditional love and deep understanding that he had for them. In the wake of his death, Steve would leave behind his grieving wife Terry and two young children, aforementioned eight-year-old Bindi, as well as his son Robert, who was just two years old at the time of his father's passing. In tribute to her late father, Bindi would go on to win Dancing with the Stars and dedicate her life to continuing his legacy. Her brother Robert would grow up to launch the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve in 2019, located on Australia's Cape York Peninsula. The Irwin family continues to carry on his legacy, despite massive criticism of their willingness to subject themselves to the potential risks and dangers that come with interacting with some of the world's most deadliest animals. Tommy Woodward was a 28-year-old Texas man who made national headlines in 2015. Before getting into his story, however, I humbly request that comments remain respectful, especially when it comes to this attack as comments from certain individuals in the past on social media platforms had in fact sadly caused further emotional pain to Tommy's family. While growing up in a town called Pacific, just outside Missouri, Texas, Tommy Woodward, his twin brother, and older sister had to endure an undeniably tough childhood. After their world shattered following their parents' separation, the family would struggle to make ends meet, and years would go by this way. The charming and fast-talking boy would join a traveling carnival as a carny and go on tour for a few months. 
Upon returning to Pacific, Tommy would then work with his dad remodeling Sonic Drive-Ins, a business that would last for just a short while before drying out. And so, Tommy would then work odd jobs in Pacific for years, struggling to get by and barely making ends meet. It wasn't until Tommy was in his early 20s that he'd receive a call from his twin brother Brian, who'd been living with his wife and child at this point in Orange, Texas, the state's easternmost city. As a result of the hardships that they endured together whilst growing up, Tommy had developed an extremely strong bond with Brian. In fact, at some point during their high school years, the twins even spent a few months living in a tent under a bridge a time in which the brothers would go days without eating. Aware of just how hard life still was for Tommy in Pacific, Brian not only offers him a job in Orange, but furthermore assures him that he wouldn't have to worry about finding a place to live and that he was more than welcome to stay with him and the family at their home for as long as he needed. Knowing there wasn't a future for him in Pacific anymore, Tommy accepts his brother's offer, packs his bags, and heads to Orange, Texas for a much needed fresh start. Tommy would thereafter stay with his brother and his family in Orange County, Texas. The hardworking and motivated young man would finally get his own place in the same neighborhood as his brother, his older sister Tabitha, and their mom, Kelly, who Tommy was especially close with and would often call late at night even while drunk just to say hi and have a conversation with, affirming just how strong their mother-son bond was. It's also worth noting that although Tommy and Brian were heavy drinkers, the two were extremely hard workers and were very well liked. In fact, by most accounts from those that knew them, there was never a dull moment with the Woodward family, and it was Tommy who was especially loved for his natural charm and outgoing nature. Swimming, dancing, and hanging out with the people he loved at the local Burkhart's Marina. Life had never been better for Tommy. By the time he turned 28, he'd be a regular at Adams Bayou, a bar at the marina, and although he'd drink pretty heavily, people knew him more for making everyone around him smile, and was known as a pleasant drunk who just wanted everyone to have a good time. On July 2nd of 2015, Tommy had been enjoying a typical late night at the Bayou Bar, drinking lots of beer, playing pool and shuffleboard with some friends and locals, and of course, doing what he did best, showing everyone a good time. At about 2 a.m., a drunken Tommy decides to go out for a swim with his friend Victoria in the dark waters of Adams Bayou, just outside Burkhart's Marina. It's important to note that just weeks prior to this night, Kent Robnett, a local construction worker, had reported seeing a huge gator in the middle of the bayou. Although gators were quite common in this area, it's usually cause for concern when a gator as large as this one displays itself so outwardly. And this is because alligators that grow to such massive sizes are typically smart and stealthy, a key component for the success of a predator in terms of natural selection. Robnett's report furthermore indicated that not only did he believe that this alligator had lost its fear of humans for being so out in the open, but he furthermore noted that the massive gator had apparent scars and scratch marks on its face and stated that it had a bad look to it, akin to something out of a horror movie. It's also worth noting that the owner of the marina had in fact seen the very same gator in the bayou, which is when he immediately put up a no swimming sign, a sign which Tommy would unfortunately choose to ignore on this fateful night. As the pair approach the water's edge, Victoria suddenly notices the huge gator swim out from under the dock blatantly reacting to their presence and displaying clear signs that it was not intimidated at the slightest. The gator stealthily raises its head out of the water in typical ambush fashion, scanning for potential prey items near the water's edge. I once again request that it's extremely important that we remain respectful from here on out and keep an open mind especially if you intend on commenting on this video. Victoria shouts to Tommy, alerting him of the alligator's presence which is when a once again extremely drunk and clearly overconfident Tommy yells, F that gator, and then immediately jumps into the water. As Tommy casually swims to a small island on the other side of the bayou, a stunned Victoria looks on in horror as Tommy is pulled under the water. Just moments later, Tommy resurfaces and yells to Victoria to stay out of the water as she attempted to jump in and try to help. Victoria shouts to Tommy to hold on, and then instantly turns and sprints back up to the marina bar. She then alerts bartender Michelle Wright of the incident. A stunned Michelle frantically dials 911 and reports the incident as fast as she could, at the same time grabbing her flashlight and heading out to the bayou with Victoria. After about five minutes of scanning for Tommy in the dark bayou waters, Michelle spots Tommy's body face down near the dock. The gator viciously pulls Tommy's limp body into the water for what would be a final time, ending the 28-year-old's life in the matter of minutes. Two hours after the attack, 
Tommy's body was recovered from the bayou waters, with his devastated twin brother Brian on sight. His left arm was missing, indicating that the gator had grabbed him around his elbow and drowned him, followed by a death roll, something they typically do with their prey in order to rip off limbs, thereafter stashing the body for later consumption. A hunt for the gator was thereby initiated by local game wardens, all of whom failed to bring down the intelligent reptile. And so, after multiple failed attempts by the game wardens throughout a 72-hour time span, in comes aforementioned construction worker Kent Robnett, who at last takes it upon himself to kill the gator. Robnett thereby sets up a number of gator traps and lines around the bayou, and within just 24 hours, successfully manages to capture the gator, which he instantly killed with 7 rounds to the head upon capture indicating that he couldn't help himself as he repeated his previous statement that this particular gator had an evil look to it. Robnett would thereafter turn himself in to wildlife authorities shortly after capturing and killing the gator, and this can most likely be chalked up to the fact that he was feeling guilty after having killed what could possibly have been the wrong gator, and that too without a license. Despite his suspicions however, and to his good fortune, Kent would be relieved to find out that the gator he'd caught was in fact the same one that had killed Tommy as human remains would be found in its stomach shortly after it was captured and killed. Because Kent was honest and did kill the right gator, the authorities would eventually decide to let him off with a warning. Knowing just how easy of a target Tommy would be and given his brazen attitude during the time of the attack, not to mention his heavy drinking habits, the media would thereafter unfortunately write dozens of articles painting Tommy as an ignorant alcoholic who deserved what happened to him. This in turn would of course cause even further pain to Tommy's family, as previously mentioned. And what's even more tragic was that the family was already shattered and mourning the shocking loss of their most beloved family member. This tragic incident marked the first time that an alligator attack led to a human fatality in all of Texas since 1836.